Welcome back. It's still the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. The National Human Rights Commission on Sunday raised concern over the rising food crisis in the country, saying it had worsened access to healthy and nutritious food, especially among uh, intently displaced persons and vulnerable uh, groups, leading to increase in widespread hunger and low quality of life. Now, the commission attributed uh, the scenario to several factors, including insecurity, uh, chasing farmers from their farms, a couple with many farmlands being submerged in water due to the flooding situation in parts of the country. Today we're hearing 33 states affected. Now, according to a statement by the National Human Rights Commission, uh, through its Deputy Director of Public Affairs and Inter External Linkages, uh, Fatima Agwai Mohammed, uh, she says the Executive Secretary of the Commission, uh, Chief Tony Ojuku, stated this in Abuja as Nigeria joins the global community to celebrate the World Food Day which is held on October 16 every year. We're glad to say we have joining us on a breakfast uh, to discuss this situation of uh, a food crisis. Is there really a food crisis in Nigeria? Uh, Mr. Kelvin Imano, who happens to be uh, an agriculture and agro expert. Uh, uh, Kelvin Imano, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we're glad to have you join us on Plus TV Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Um, uh, do you agree with uh, the position uh, of the National Human Rights Commission when they say there is a food crisis in Nigeria as we speak? Yes, yes, there is a food crisis in Nigeria. Before the whole flooding situation started, there was already a food crisis. Because um, if you look at the major commodities that are consumed on a daily basis, like rice, like um, wheat, uh, maize, maize is like this. 65% of all the maize grown in Nigeria is actually used for animal feed, for example. So you have the likes of uh, maize flour, you have cere cereals that are eaten all over the country on a daily basis. There was already like a five, six million metric sh um, ton shortage of maize before this whole flooding situation started. There was already like a shortage of wheat in Nigeria that has caused the price, the hike on the price of bread, you know, and there was also a shortage of rice. So this whole flooding situation is exacerbated and it's a real crisis because quite a number of, a third of the country is currently underwater and quite a number of commercial farms are currently being taken over by flood. You know, so it's, um, the whole flooding situation has just made a bad situation worse and it's, it's going to reflect in inflation numbers that the MPS will release this week. I expect that food inflation is going to come at, out at, at least 25% from current 23.12%. Mm -hmm. And the situation is only going to get worse over the coming months in Nigeria. So we're just beginning to see the um, acceleration of um, food inflation in Nigeria. Well, uh, prior to this time, uh, we're very aware of the situation in the north central part of Nigeria, on the northern part of Nigeria, if you like to say, uh, following, you know, uh, violence and conflict that has resulted to it. And as much, we've also had farmers, you know, asking that government should step in to help ensure that the effects is actually taken away. But uh, for the want of time, let's get to it. Do you think anything can really be done at this point in time? Uh, security concerns with the flooding issue uh, to help, you know, solve the problem? Well, to be honest with you, it's too late in the day. Um, and the reason is because, if I think, was, was it a week or two ago, I noted on how the Nigerian government has been very responsible in blaming the whole situation of uh, the flaws on climate change, which is a convenient excuse the Nigerian government uses these days for nearly every problem you have in Nigeria. For example, food inflation started really accelerating and the Nigerian government started blaming Russia and Ukraine. But even before Russia and Ukraine, there, there was food um, crisis in Nigeria. Um, the situation in the north, the insecurity in the north that uh, cut down the production, the output of food by about 50%, um, is even now worsened by the flood situation. And of course, the situation is because of the lack of dam in northern Cameroon, you know, and if you go back in time, you realize that in 1982, Nigeria signed an MOU with the Cameroonian government that was going to build a buffer dam called the Dasin Hausa Dam, in Adamawa State, and also in Katsina Ala, um, to try to create like a buffer for the current of um, flow of the water uh, coming from that dam 
And that dam is primarily responsible for the whole flooding situation you have in Nigeria. It has completely nothing to do with climate change. You know, and Nigerian Meteorological um, Agency warned about the situation um, early this year, that there was going to be a situation like this. Nigerian government didn't take any precautions. So it's, it's very late in the day. There's practically nothing it can do because you have, you have to dredge the river Niger. You have to uh, build like two dams to create buffers. Um, I just said this morning that the Nigerian government is going to send a delegation to Cameroon. That is not going to achieve anything. So the whole situation in the, in the north central, with insecurity, with flooding, there is it's too late in the day. There is nothing we can do. And uh, it's really, really unfortunate that um, considering the situation you have in Nigeria today, the, the government is quiet. They've not said anything. President and vice president are sitting tight here in Abuja. They've not shown any concern. They've not gone to visit victims. They've not set up IDP camps. The government has not provided any guidance on like for relief. I heard it's going to release about, uh, um, I think, 300 metric tons of grains from national to a strategic uh, grain reserve. That's not going to lift fingers or you know, ameliorate the bad situation you have currently across Nigeria. Um, I, I think they need to come up with a more realistic plan to assure the people on how to um, prevent a repeat of the situation and provide like a buffer for the really hope, very hopeless situation you have on the ground across Nigeria. And I'm also surprised that the presidential candidates have not suspended their campaigns to see to go around the country and help the people. I'm, I'm really shocked. You have a crisis. You have a crisis, and no one is saying anything. It's, it's very, very shocking. Well, I'd like to share your thought quickly on this one. I mean, uh, the insight that you have brought really very, very fantastic, especially when you say that we can't currently blame, you know, the food insecurity that we're faced with on uh, climate change and the flooding prior to this time. Uh, this has actually been going on. But this morning, uh, there are reports that the federal government is blaming uh, the flood situation, which is also going to have an impact, already having an impact on food and its production on the state and the federal government. I like that you quickly, you know, share your thoughts on that. <laughs> they, so they are blaming the situation on the state and on the federal on the state government. Okay. And the local governments. I beg your pardon. Okay. So so first of all, the federal government cannot blame the situation on the local government or the state government. Number one, because the Autonomy of the local government has been an issue. So if you look at this, uh, the uh, allocation of uh, fed, uh, federal allocation for the Resource Mobilization and Federal Allocation Commission, RMFAC, um, that controls the um, FAC, you see that the formula currently is about uh, 55, 29, 16. Federal, state, local government. Federal government gets 65 percent. States gets 29 percent. Local government gets 16 uh, percent. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, you you have to ask the the presidency what has been what has been the um, autonomy and distribution of resources to the local governments over the years. Number one, at local governments and part at the grassroots to really create drainages um, to really ensure that. This situation, this ecological crisis you have in Nigeria, um, it, it, it does not pose a threat. Number one, number two, have the governors been effective with the ecological funds that they've gotten over the past um, years, or has those ecological funds been siphoned and diverted and with no consequences? Number two, number three, has the federal government done what it's supposed to do to ensure that it dredges um, the river Niger? I remember during the uh, Good Love Jonathan in 2012 or 2011, they awarded the project, the contract to Nigerian uh, True and New one, Nigerian Land Waterways Authority, about four billion to dredge river Niger, bordering around Lukoja and the Ben tributaries. That, that was not done, you know, and that project was not taken seriously. And NIMET has been warning for several years that this kind of situation might happen if the river Niger is not dredged. Number two. So has the federal government? done what it's supposed to do to ensure that creates buffer dams to break the current and regulate the flow of water from northern Cameroon. Lagdo Dam is a dam that provides electricity for um, a major part of Cameroon and also acts as a buffer for the flow of current of water when uh, uh, the rainfall um, is, is, this thing is very high. 
So has the federal government done what it's supposed to do? No. The answer is no, it hasn't. It has always paid lip service to this issue and it's not done anything about it. So the lack of coordination, I, I won't put any blame on the local government. The lack of coordination between the federal government and the state governments is the reason why you have the current situation you have in Nigeria. And let me just say this. Let me just say this. It's unfortunate that at a time when you have um, the, a major part of Kogi state is submerged, yeah, and you have a crisis. A lot of people have been internally displaced. The number, last numbers I heard is that 500 plus people are dead and 1.4 million people are displaced. Yeah, the governor of Kogi state sent thugs, more than 500 thugs, to go to Obajana, a shut down Dangote cement, which is the largest cement plant in the whole of Africa. And those talks injured 26 people. One of them is currently in ICU. Yeah. And Dangote cement plant has been shut down for quite a number of days. A major part of the Northwest currently does not have cement for production. These are the issues. Hmm. All right. Interesting uh, point you've raised there, uh, Kelvin Emanuel. Uh, um, the, you talked about the, the 12,000 metric tons of uh, food items approved by the president from the National Strategic uh, Reserve, for, Reserve uh, for distribution to uh, communities affected uh, by flooding across the country. And you said that may not be enough. But um, just to expand on that, uh, you know, last time I checked, Nigeria has not less than 33 silos, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what is the state of, of, of the country's food reserves? Um, do we have... Uh, all these silos properly stockpiled, are they being maintained uh, enough to be able to take us through at least uh, uh, the, the foreseeable immediate future through this crisis? Companies are struggling to get uh, supplies to produce. So it's, it, um, and, and the last I heard, the government was buying grains at um, a premium of about 15, 20,000 naira per metric ton. Um, so if you consider the situation I explained where you have a shortage of somewhere around 2 million metric tons of wheat, you have a shortage of uh, somewhere um, around like 3 million metric tons of uh, paddy, you have a shortage of uh, maize, about 5 to 6 million metric tons. It's very difficult for the government to be able to stockpile national strategic reserves to ensure that there's enough to feed in situations like this where you need buffers for the people. So for me, considering that there, there is already an existing food crisis, the release from the strategic grain reserve is not going to do much because there, there, there was already an existing crisis that has been made of us by the displacement of people. I heard that in Biosa currently, the entire state is shut off from supply of PMS and radio um, and DPK because most of the roads that lead in from Hauda River State, from Delta State, Patani, are completely cut off. The road that leads out from the airport in Abasoma down to the main town in Yapua is being cut off completely by the floods. It's been divided into two. So there is no way you can come in by air, there's no way you can come in by road. So people are displaced in Bayosa, in your network. People cannot get food. They, they are on the roads. They cannot get fuel. Half of the state is currently out without power. You know. So I, I, for me, I don't see, at this point in time, the only people that can help, if the situation gets worse, for example, in a state like Bayosa, is the Air Force. They have to find like an airstrip and flying supplies to help people. So I don't see how um, the release from the grain reserves is going to move the needle if the government doesn't come out with a, a holistic logistic plan to ameliorate the situation that people currently have on the ground. I don't, I don't see it because how do you want to distribute the supplies of food to different parts of the country? I, I, I just give you an example where they go, what is going on right there right now. So I, I don't, and I've not seen any plan. They, they say they're releasing it. What's the plan to distribute it around the country? To all right, so quickly, uh, as we close this conversation down, uh, Kelvin, what would you say uh, would be the implication for this, all of, I mean, the fact that we have the flood, uh, food crisis, very eminent, well, what's the implication? The implication is that food inflation is going to accelerate. Um, 
like I said, I think between today and tomorrow, and yes, what does that mean? I mean, yeah. to be very, you know, clear or simple. So, so if food inflation continues up. It's going to be more difficult for people to get food, and the prices, of course, con will continue to go up because the situation of uh, uh, supply, supply side problem, demand being higher than supply. Um, I, I, it's going to present more stark reality for the elections in 2023 because uh, it, it, quite a number of uh, um, the people contesting for offices will use it as an opportunity to provide stomach infrastructure in exchange for votes, unfortunately. Uh, situation continues and they will use, their campaign will become, okay, provide small uh, five kg of rice, uh, small bags of uh, rice and oil to, in exchange for votes, vote buying, basically. So uh, th that's the implication. Uh, it's just unfortunate. It's unfortunate that you have a country today where uh, when you look at the numbers, you realize that a major part of the income of people goes into food. I buy a loaf of bread for 1,000 and 1,200 naira. Right now, it's become the new reality. So for people who are unable to afford bread, for example, you can imagine that uh, people are not able to eat bread, which is a normal egg staple. They are not able to eat bread. So if this situation continues like this, people are going to, you know, basically be using all their income and borrowing to buy food. And it's going to result in vote buying for the elections. And it makes me wonder, honestly, if the government is really like deliberate about impoverishing the people, they are not able to afford food so that they can use, exchange uh, the people's choice at the polls All right. for, for their stomach. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so very quickly, uh, finally, um, I want you to tell us what, um, you know, I mean, the state governments can do, because I know some of them are going through a difficult time, like you mentioned, by Elsa State and Kogi State. But while we've looked at what the federal government should be doing, what can the state governments do? That's number one. Number two, what can individuals and households do to be able to take themselves through this period and the, the expecting, expectant or uh, predicted uh, uh, worsening of the situation? That's number two. And number three, what should an incoming administration do differently to make sure we don't get into such uh, a corner. So, first of all, for the states that are critically affected, like uh, Bielsa, for example, I expect that the state government should declare a state of emergency so that Nigerian Air Force can come in, Myanmar um, can come in, the Air Force can come in, because the state is completely cut off from the entire country. Um, and you, you can only use uh, cargo aircrafts to bring in supplies for the people, medicine, food, and uh, the likes. Uh, you also can also have Red Cross and all the international aid agencies to come to help help the situation. Um, I also am encouraging the state governors to be more deliberate with the ecological funds. I realize that it's not when you have a crisis that you start planning for a crisis. It's already too late for you to start planning for a crisis when you already have a crisis. That's why you have the ecological funds in the first place. Yeah, So that you can use those funds to uh, put structures on the ground, to create drainages, um, to create all kinds of buffers, probably maybe this will encourage state governors to also develop their own internal um, grain reserves so that when they have issues like this, they, they, they don't wait for the federal government to come come to their aid. They can immediately solve the problem. I also encourage state governors to you know, create some kind of fund, relief fund for the people um, to ensure that the people that uh, have their properties destroyed, they can have makeshift accommodation and food until they're able to and find a solution to their problem permanently. Yeah, right. You know, because quite a number of people, their homes have been destroyed, and uh, it's going to take a while for them to come back from the situation. Now, for what can families do, um, it's important for families that uh, are currently in uh, hot spots, situations that the areas are very vulnerable to see how they can move the way to uh, more safe um, areas. And it's important for um, them to, you know, stack supplies to see that if they are ever caught in, um, in, 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 in like, they are displaced, then they are going to be able to take care of themselves. Um, for for the incoming administration, for me, the most important thing is for them to accelerate and fast track the process of building a buffer dam in um, 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 Adamawa in uh, in. Uh, 
Taraba State, Katsina Ala, and um, also in um, Benway State. Um, it's important for them to, new administration to have new one, Nigerian Inland Waterways Authority to dredge River Niger to prevent the repeat because this like this happens every two to three years, so most likely two or three years, or even next year, this might happen again. So it's important. I, I didn't see any 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 benefit from a Nigerian delegation to Cameroon um, like unwinding the current crisis you have currently. So the the what the government can do is to prevent the repeats of the situation. The next government has the task to immediately um, build those dams to break the current and ensure that this kind of situation doesn't happen again. And it's also important that um, the government, and, and I, I'll say this, so in 2010, I remember I was sitting in a conference where then Minister of um, Trade and Investment, Olusha Finance, sorry, Olusha Goaganga, before he handed over to Kondre Wella, was speaking about then the proposed, the Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Fund was still on that um, proposal stage, he was speaking about the benefits and he was encouraging the Nigerian government fund to allow them to collapse the excess good accounts into the Sovereign Wealth Fund. That was not heeded. Um, so the Sovereign Wealth Fund, for example, has Nigerian Infrastructure Fund, Stability Fund, okay. and Future Generation Fund. So, for example, this crisis, okay. you have the Stability Fund, Stability Fund in that Sovereign Wealth Fund, to act as a buffer and provide emergency relief for Nigerians. All right. This is a lesson to the Nigerian Governors Forum that is important for you to divert free money that is not being used instead of shared among the governors okay. for their personal advertisement into the sovereign wealth fund for All investment right. and for future relief for the people. Okay, okay. Yeah, in, very interesting uh, suggestion, uh, uh, Kelvin Manu. You've taken us down memory lane. And you know, sometimes it's important to remember what transpired some years ago to know where we are, where we are today. You just uh, reminded us of some things. So thank you so much for joining us on short notice and of course giving us very expert analysis. We're grateful for your time, Kelvin. Thank you for having me, Kofi. All nice right. to meet you too. All right. All right. That's Kelvin Imano. He's an agro expert. Messi, a lot to talk about and unpack. I wish we had more time, but we have to go. Well, these conversations will never end. The flood will is still with us and uh, not to sound very, uh, you know, not positive. Well, it feels like it will always be with us until we do the need for. But that's the size of our conversation this morning on The Breakfast. If you missed out on any part, it will be fine to follow us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. Subscribe to our channels at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. My name is Messi Bopo. Have a great day. And my name is Kofi Bartels. Today's in the public holiday. I don't know what happened to me. But we'll return tomorrow with more on The Breakfast. Good morning. <laughs>